Thank you. Thank you, Brars. Uh, so my name is Itamar, Itamar Ravid. I'm a freelance software developer. I've been doing Scala for the last three years, mostly functional programming. Um, what I do is I help uh, teams and uh, companies break down monoliths and uh, move to functional programming and do some DevOps. Um, but happily, we will not be discussing any of that today, just functors. Um, so um, my Twitter handle is at the footers of the slide, so feel free to tweet at me throughout the talk. And uh, what we will be discussing today is functors, but functors that are lesser known than the uh, usual uh, functor that we all know. And um, so let's get started. Um, and what better way to get started than with the map function, which we all know and love, that lets us um, apply functions to elements of a list and convert integers to strings, and it lets us convert the maybe present element of the option into a string as well. And um, a lesser known um, definition of the map function is for the tuple in which we can apply a function to the right element of the tuple and convert that integer to a string as well. And of course, given an IO computation, um, this using uh, the IO monad from cat's effect, we can also apply a map function to apply a function to the, uh, to the uh, value produced by the IO computation and convert that integer to a string. Now, um, sorry about that. We'll be back in a moment. Now, just by um, using the map function, which we'll see in a second, we can de um, derive some pretty cool combinators like the f product function, which will, um, it's like, kind of like the map function. See you in a moment. It's kind of like the map function. And it keeps the uh, value that was present in the functor along with the value produced by the function that you give to the map function. And we also have the as combinator, which just, which just replaces the value inside the functor. And we have the void function. Oops, sorry about that. We have the void function, which discards the value and keeps the unit value. So these are all very cool combinators, which we can just derive by using the map function. And, you know, let's focus for a moment on the type class definition itself. Um, so the type class is defined by just by the map function. And its meaning is if we give the map function an f of a and a function from a to b, we get back a, fun uh, a functor of b, an f of b. So of course, this um, type class is also governed by a few laws. So the identity law says that the functor should preserve identities. So mapping with the identity function is a no op. And it should also preserve composition. So if I map with f and I map with g, that's the same as mapping with f and then g. Now, um, are functors just about replacing the value inside the type constructor? Well, they are, but there's a bit more. I mean, if I just rearrange slightly the um, arguments given to map, I now get something that's more like, if you give me a plain function, a function from A to B, then I can give you back a fancy function from F of A. So this is pretty cool. And to see this in action, we can use uh, a parser as an example. So a parser is, you could just define it very naively as a function from a string to an option of A. So this is, we could define a functor for this type. And here's a parser for this person case class, which I've written here. This person case class is just a record of two fields. And the parser for this is a function that splits a string a, on a comma. And assuming there are indeed exactly two fields, it stuffs it in an option in the person. And of course, the two int could fail, but let's ignore that for now. Now, what does map for this um, type me? Well, if I have a parser of a person in this uh, value here, person parser, and I map this, this parser, and I convert the resulting 
um, person to a string, then if, this says that if I know to transform persons to strings, then I know free of charge to transform person parsers to name parsers. And this is a pretty cool um, property of the functor that lets us translate plain functions to fancy functions. Now, um, back to the type class definition, I would like to know that this is actually a covariant functor. Um, we use it in, in our day-to-day -day as a plain old functor, but this is actually a covariant functor. And this has some relation to subtype variants, which you know of from with the plus and minus uh, annotations that you can add to type parameters, but it it's, doesn't really matter for now, for this talk. Okay, so covariant functors are actually all about producing values. So this parser will produce an int given a, a proper string, and this option might produce an int, it might be there, it might not, and this list will produce many integers. So, so covariant functors are all about producing values. Now, the technical explanation here is that the underlying type must have the type parameters show only on the right-hand side of the function, but the intuition here is that covariant functors are about producing values. So, of course, we love FP, and we love to look at duals of things, so let's look at the dual of a producer, which is a consumer. So here's a predicate function function from A to Boolean. This is a predicate of A. It kind of looks like a covariant functor. And here's an integer predicate. It's a function that tests whether a given integer is even. And here's an integer rendering function. It takes an int, converts it to a string. So the question is, can we compose them together somehow? Can we use some sort of map function to apply the render to the predicate? So to see this graphically, here's our predicate. It's a function from an integer to a string, to a Boolean. And here's our, our many slides ahead. And here's our rendering function. It's a function from an integer to a string. So the question is again, can we compose them together somehow? So the answer is no. The problem is they both consume the integer. But since we're dead set on composing something today, with this uh, predicate function, we can try composing it with a producer of integers. So here's a function called produce, takes a string, converts it to an integer. So we can somehow pre-compose the predicate with this function, with this rendering function. Now, in code, what this looks like is taking the produce function and the uh, predicate and using, and then, the, and then combinator to compose them together. So I take produce and I stick it before the predicate, and now I get back a predicate of string, which is pretty cool because predicate of int looks like a functor, and the produce function, which is from string to int, acted like the mapping function, but the types are backwards, right? Instead of having uh, produce b from int to string, we have its types flipped. So contravariant functors are all about these backwards functors. Um, so the contravariant functor is defined by the contramap function, which takes an f of a, a function from b to a, instead of a to b, and gives us back an f of b. This is pretty... Um, confusing and stumpy uh, for a few times before, and let's contrast this with the covariant functor. So as you can see, the only difference between them, apart from the name of the function, is the uh, order of the type of the types of the f function. Now um, we can see that um, another interesting property of this contravariant functor is that it lifts functions. To, from f of b to f of a, to, uh, sorry, functions from b to a, to functions from f of a to f of b. So this flipping behavior is also preserved when lifting functions, plain functions, to fancy functions, as we've said before. Now, 
Uh, can't forget the laws. Uh, the contravariant functor also preserves identity, so contramapping with the identity function is, again, a no-op. And contramapping with f and then contramapping with g is equivalent to contramapping with g and then f. So this flipping behavior is also reflected in the laws. So in our case, instead of using and then, if we had defined a contravariant functor instance, sorry, for the predicate, we could use contramap. So predicate contramap produce would take us from predicate event to predicate of string. Pretty cool. Um, what other contravariant functors can we find in the wild? Well, in fact, anything that looks like a function that takes a value, right? Takes an A. So an encoder of, of anything to a string is a contravariant functor. We could define a contravariant functor for that. An ordering has a contravariant functor as well. And the left fold function is a contravariant functor on the A type parameter. So um, I didn't include the instances, but you'll take my word for it. Um, what's the point, right? So what's the point of these contravariant functors? So let's say we have a, a encoder for uh, a string, just takes a string and codes it to a JSON or whatever. And we have some sort of new type kind of case class, first name that wraps a value uh, of string and converts it to our own case class. And we'd like to reuse that um, encoder for a string for our new type. So we could just use contramap on the encoder and convert it to an encoder of first name just by providing a function from first name to a string. All right, this is pretty confusing at first, but you'll get the hang of it once you define a few of those. Okay, so here's a trick question. Is this a contravariant functor or a covariant functor? Because we've seen that, functor, that functions are covariant if they produce values, and they are contravariant if they consume values. And this function here both consumes and produces an A. So the, the answer is that it's both. This is actually an invariant functor. The invariant functor is like taking a covariant functor and a contravariant functor and sticking them both in the same type class. So the invariant functor has two laws as well, identity and composition. Um, you will note that it is defined um, by the IMAP function, which takes an f of a, a function from a to b, and a function from b to a. So we need to um, give it functions for both directions to do the mapping operation. So the laws preserve identity and composition in both directions. And um, just to see this in action graphically, uh, all right. So let's say I have a, a new type kind of situation again. I have an age, a new type of, a, of an integer, and I need a semigroup for that. All right, it's pretty, easy, pretty straightforward to define a semigroup for, uh, for an integer, and I'd like to reuse my existing semigroup for integers for the ages. So what I'm going to do, graphically, is take a function from int and int, int and a tuple of ints to an integer, and I'm going to pre-compose it with a function from age to int, from tuple of age to tuple of int, and post-compose it with a function from int to age. So I'm going to unwrap and rewrap the integers in my new type. And this is exactly the IMAP operation. All right? Now, this seems to be uh, increasing as we go f further along the functor complexity. Uh, so in code, what this looks like is taking my integer semigroup, which is just a function that smashes two in integers together, and IMAPing it to give it to wrap the integer in an age and unwrap it, if we had defined um, an invariant functor instance for the um, semigroup. OK, so now you know invariant functors. Now, an interesting thing about functors is that they compose. So if I have an f, which is a functor, and a g, which is a functor, I can wrap them both together to get back another functor as well which is a pretty cool property because all of these um, instances here, all these types here, are all functors. 
So an IO of an option, of an either, of a string to pers or a person, and the list of predicates, and the predicates of lists are all functors, just by the fact that they all are composed of layers um, or functors. But which functor? Right, we've seen several types. So the cool thing is that this works like plus and minus with uh, multiplication. So if I compose a contravariant and covariant in any given order, I get back a contravariant. And if I compose two functors of the same type, I get back a covariant. Now, so what can we do by just by composing functors? So um, with cats, we need to um, wrap this uh, nested thing um, in two layers of the nested data type just to guide the implicit resolution to use uh, the right uh, functions. Um, so in this case, if I double wrap the um, nested thing here with the nested, I can use map to descend right to the um, how do you do it? right to the uh, person type here and convert it to a string just by using the nested data type and the fact that functors compose. And of course, if I have a list of predicates of string, which is a combination of a contravariant and covariant functor, I could use contramap to convert it to a list of predicate of person, right? By using contramap and giving, giving it a function from person to string. And this works the other way as well. If I have a predicate that um, takes a list of string and creates a boolean, I, can, I could convert it to a predicate of list of person. This is pretty cool and great for reuse. And these are just functors, right? I didn't include here any examples of, you know, applicative or traverse and um, com combining these, these uh, composition methods with those type classes really yields very expressive uh, um, behaviors. Okay, let's recall either or lovely data type. So it's defined by two cases, right and left, and we can handily map the right value by using the covariant functor instance um, and using the map function. But what about the left value? How do we um, apply some sort of function to that value? So let's say we have uh, two types of errors. I have a simple error and a composite error that is composed of several results with the uh, error type in its left high parameter, and I'd like to convert it to a composite error because I'm going to do something with that. Well, to do that, um, we have out of the box the left map infix syntax to convert, to apply a function to the left-hand side of the either. So from this, we gather that either behaves covariantly in both type parameters, but we can't just use the map function. We need to somehow distinguish between the uh, type parameters that we are um, applying the function to. So, handily, we have for that the bifunctor. The bifunctor is defined for a type constructor with two slots. So instead of having f uh, defined for one slot, we have f taking two type parameters, and it is defined by the bimap function, which takes an f of a and b, a function from a to c and a function from b to d, and gives us back an f of c and d. And of course, um, this functor also has two laws um, governing uh, composition and identity. And this bifunctor preserves identity in both slots and preserves composition in both slots, um, forward composition. Now, um, either has an instance of bifunctor. We just pattern match on the either, we check which one do we have, left or right, and we apply the right function. And we could have used bimap in our error example if we had wanted to um, convert both uh, uh, type parameters. Now a tuple also has a bifunctor instance, um, but of course, why should you care? Why should we go through this abstraction we, when we could just pattern match or apply the uh, functions? Well, one reason, is that bifunctors also compose. Well, here's a uh, two options data type, which is a function with two options. And this is actually a bifunctor. It's a bifunctor with a functor composed on each of its type parameters. And I could use bimap on this data type um, with, some, with jumping through some hoops. I could use bimap and write values inside the option. And this list of tuples is also a bifunctor. It's a bifunctor, the tuple, composed inside a functor, the list. And I could use bimap for this as well. 
and they both form a bifunctor. And uh, just a, a nice comment is that Ed Komet calls them Biff and Tannen for bifunctor, functor, functor, and Tannen for Biff Tannen in his bifunctors package. Now, if we had some sort of uh, binested data type in cats, we could do something like this, but um, maybe there's a different way to do that, but um, we don't have some sort of data type like that yet. Maybe that's a cool idea for a pull request. Um, so we could do something like by mapping straight into the uh, tuple inside each element of the list if we had this some sort of binested data type. Okay, and with by traversable, I couldn't resist. We could do even more fancy tricks like uh, taking a tuple of two options and flipping the layers and getting, getting back an option of a tuple using the by sequence operation. Okay, now, this fancy type here. Would you say this is a bifunctor? Just a function? Would, would this be a bifunctor? Well, we've seen that bifunctors should uh, behave covariantly in each type parameter. And we've seen that functions behave contravariantly. So this is actually a profunctor. A profunctor is kind of like a bifunctor. I've uh, included here the two signatures. It is defined by dimap instead of bimap. And the only difference is that the function applied to the left type parameter is contravariant. So to apply a function to the left type parameter, we need to use contravariant composition. And um, of course, this is governed by laws as well, uh, by the, the profunctor preserves identity in both its type parameters, and it um, preserves composition, contravariant composition and covariant composition in each type parameter. And we could say that the profunctor is some sort of a generalized function. So here's our F type constructor, F from A to B, and our dimap operation is precomposing the F function uh, on the left-hand side and postcomposing the G function. So that's the dimap operation. Now, um, the place function is, of course, a profunctor. We've seen that. Is there anything cooler? Well, there is. Um, there is the uh, fold data type, which I've taken from uh, one of uh, Gabriel Gonzalez's uh, posts. This um, fold data type represents a fold, a left fold. Um, it has two functions, a tally function, which re represents one step of the fold, and the summarize function, which represents the final processing done to the uh, folding state. And this, too, has a profunctor instance, right? So we can use the profunctor instance to handily adapt the folds, something which would be kind of awkward to do manually. So let's say I have a summing fold, right? I have the um, tally function, which is just... Um, appending the two, uh, um, summing the two integers together, and the summarize function is just the identity function, okay? Take the uh, summing result, do nothing with it, just give it back. And let's say I want to uh, take my uh, new type, age new type from before, and adapt this summing fold to, uh, to use, to, to work on ages. So I could do that using dimap. I can convert it to, uh, to uh, a fold that works on ages by providing a function from age to integers. This is the left type uh, parameter. And providing a function that pretty prints the result. So just by using dimap, we've done something that would have been kind of awkward to do um, on the uh, fold case class. So um, unsurprisingly, profunctors also compose. So here's a profunctor. This is um, a function from A to list of B. It's a profunctor because a function is a profunctor. And it has a functor, a covariant functor, composed on the right-hand side. So this is a profunctor. And you might recognize this as a closely arrow. And um, in fact, functors and many more other um, type classes, but they all are profunctors. And the, pr the cool thing is that this is a profunctor as well. I could compose a covariant functor on the left type parameter, and I could use dimap to adapt this function and completely ignore the fact that there is an option there. And the last thing 
is that we could compose covariant functors on both type parameters and still use DIMAP and completely ignore the fact that we have an option in the list there and just provide functions from that work on A and B to adapt the type parameters of this function. So in fact, any function between two functors is a pro functor as well, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, so what we've seen are four type classes that I hope were new to you and uh, you'll uh, be able to use them in your day-to-day -day programming, the contravariant, the invariant, the, bi the bifunctor, and the profunctor. And they all are defined by some sort of a mapping function. And these are just the starting point because, in fact, the actual type class hierarchy in CATS and calls it are uh, much more involved and elaborate and provide much more expressive behavior if you uh, just take a look at it. So that's the end of my talk, and I hope this was informative for you. And I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Any questions? I have some question about cats. Uh, so uh, you all see the nested, nested, the double nest. Uh, is there a way to uh, like import some automatic uh, conversion so that uh, the compiler automatically find the, the deepest uh, composition automatically for you? You don't have to type nested twice. Is that possible? I don't know of any way. This is the, uh, the, the standard behavior in the library. You need to uh, do a sort of a new type thing to uh, instruct the uh, compiler to find the right instance. Um, but maybe those are, there are some cats contributors here. Maybe I'll look at those. More questions? In that case, thanks. Thank you very much.